All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Spiros Darmanis, and I am one of the group leaders at the uh, recently founded uh, Trans Zuckerberg Biohub. And today I am going to talk to you about the Tabula Muris, uh, 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 a preprint we released on BioArchive uh, not so long ago, uh, where basically we we attempted to characterize a transcriptome of uh, 20 different uh, mouse tissues at single cell resolution. Um, I'll start by giving a, a brief description of what uh, Tabula Muris actually is, what it consists of, and what we are hoping and aiming to do with this um, before I give an overview and proceed to the main part of my talk. So the, the Tabula Muris is basically a collection of approximately 100,000 uh, single cell transcriptomic profiles and from <clears throat> across 20 different uh, mouse tissues and uh, across seven or eight, eight actually uh, different mice. Now, <clears throat> um, we think that this constitutes a, a unique single cell transcriptomic resource, uh, not so much because of the numbers of cells. Uh, today's technologies uh, allow, you know, uh, pretty much everyone to generate these numbers of, of single cell RNA sequencing data points without so much trouble. But um, we've done so across 20 different tissues, meaning that at the same time, we're able to investigate uh, single cell phenotypes across the entire organism. So uh, what we think that uh, the Tabula Muris is going to be is a reference for cellular phenotypes. Um, it can help in the discovery of novel cell type specific genes and uh, cell type is put in brackets, uh, so probably more cell states or cellular phenotypes would be more accurate. <clears throat> it would allow people to perform comparisons of such phenotypes across different tissues uh, within the same organism. Uh, since we use two different methods to collect our data, I will come back to that uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, this data set can be used to perform method comparison in order to decide what is the best method to use for, for a given question that uh, you might have before starting your experiments. And finally, we believe that uh, we can use this data set uh, together with uh, additional data sets that exist uh, in order to start uh, getting a much better idea of what's happening uh, down to the single cell level in these tissues, both uh, in vitro and as well as in situ. Now, most importantly, it's been a multi-collaborative effort involving more than 60 people working hands-on on this uh, across four different institutions uh, in the Bay Area and with involving 15 different labs with uh, different tissue expertise. Now, this, uh, what you see here is, is basically an overview of the study and it also is an overview of uh, the biggest part of my talk where I will, where I will actually uh, go, go through what we've done and try to provide some context and some background for some of the things that might uh, most non-experts might not be familiar with. So uh, I will start right ahead with the, uh, again, uh, we involved seven different mice in the study, uh, four male mice and three female mice, and uh, we harvested uh, tissues from these mice in a centralized location, and then distributed these tissues to the 15 labs, uh, each of which has its own tissue expertise. You can see a list of the tissues included on the bottom left, and for some of these tissues, uh, we also included sub-regions of those. So, for example, for the brain, uh, we tried to isolate both uh, microglia and non-microglial cells from uh, four different regions, the hippocampus, the cortex, the cerebellum, and the striatum. Uh, for the heart, we processed each of the four chambers separately, and we also included the aorta. The fat tissue, we processed both brown, subcutaneous, mesenteric, mesenteric and gland of fat, uh, and so on. Now, once each of the collaborating labs received these tissues, they went back to their own space and dissociated these of these tissues with, uh, with a protocol that is specific and uh, aims to maximize both cell viability and cell recovery. Um, and then all the cells were brought back to centralized locations for downstream processing. I would like to highlight at this point that all of the protocols that we use for performing tissue dissociation up to sorting uh, and cDNA preparation and so on, but for this part, uh, everything is available on the preprint version uh, on BioArchive. So, as I said, once the, once the tissues were dissociated and single cell suspensions were created, the suspensions were brought back to 
uh, four centralized locations uh, where they were sorted in 34 wheel plates. Uh, as I said before, at the beginning of my presentation, we chose two different methods to, um, to generate single cell RNA sequencing data. The one we refer to as fax, basically is fax sorting of single cells uh, in plates and then processing them um, in this manner. And then the second one is the microfluidic approach uh, available by 10X Genomics that I will describe in a minute. So for the, for the first approach, as I said, the cells were sorted in three to four plates. I'm showing here two representative types of, uh, of uh, fax gating schemes used. For example, on the top, you see the mammary, which was uh, sorted based on the expression of a given surface epitopes, C24 and C49F in this case. Uh, as well as some other tissues were also sorted in this way, like the bone marrow, for example. And then there were tissues like the liver that I'm showing here that was basically sorted on the uh, only gating on viability. So we sorted cells that look of, have, seem to be, have a reasonable size and uh, seem to be viable uh, based on standard markers. <clears throat> Um, once the cells were sorted, the cDNA was generated in the microtiter wells using the smart C2 uh, approach, uh, which I'm, I'm showing here. So in, in brief, what's happening is that uh, an oligo-DT primer is used to generate the, the, the cDNA. The, the, <clears throat> the reverse transcriptase uh, adds uh, a number of C's at the end of, uh, of the cDNA, and then there is a, what is referred to as a template switching oligo that helps the reverse transcriptase perform template switches, and thus you end up with uh, a molecule of cDNA that contains uh, known primers at its end, and thus uh, all the cDNA molecules created within a single cell can now be amplified uh, using universal PCR, and this step is really important, otherwise we wouldn't get enough material from a single cell to perform the next step, which is the library preparation for sequencing that for this paper was done exclusively using the Nexera XT system that uses the TN5 transposase uh, available from Illumina. <clears throat> Um, moving on to the microfluidic approach, as I said, uh, all cells here were processed in, uh, in one location uh, using the Chromium single cell kit, which is available by 10X Genomics. In briefly, uh, what's happening here is that single cells together with, uh, with beads that contain reagents for reverse transcription are encapsulated in oil emulsions. The cells are lysed. They're their cDNA uh, is, is produced and then the emulsions are basically broken, everything is processed together. And at the end, when we sequence uh, these libraries, we can tell uh, there are three distinct barcodes on the, on the molecules generated by this process. And each of these is, is, called, is serving as a barcode for the library. In our case, that would be the tissue. Uh, for the bead, that would be the cell. And then there is also a UMI, a unique molecular identifier that serves as an identifier for its uh, sequence molecule. <clears throat> um, all of the libraries, uh, no matter if they were coming from the fax or the microfluidic approach, uh, were sequenced on Illumin uh, Illumina's uh, Novasic. Um, for fax, uh, we got approximately 700,000 reads uh, for every single cell. And then all of the reads that came out of the sequencer were aligned to the MM10 reference genome uh, using STAR. And then the gene counts were processed by HTSIC. All the details uh, and the scripts used are, again, part of the uh, release preprint. And then for uh, 10X, for the microfluidic um, part of the data set, everything was processed uh, using Cell Ranger, which is a software available by 10X Genomics using their default parameters. Um, <clears throat> once we've you know, aligned and counted the, um, uh, the sequencing data, uh, we proceeded with the initial data analysis. So we excluded genes that uh, appeared in fewer than five cells, and we also excluded cells that had less than 500 detected genes. Um, we then used, um, we selected variable genes based on their over dispersion, and then performed principal component analysis to uh, project this uh, still high dimensional space of variable genes down down to a lower dimensional subspace on which we uh, performed <clears throat> uh, the actual clustering. And then to visualize the results of clustering, we analyze the same distance matrix uh, using uh, TSNE um, and then projected the uh, 
uh, cell clusters uh, back on this uh, two-dimensional space. Uh, we then asked each of the, of the labs that were involved uh, with each of the tissues to perform an initial annotation of the data. And by annotation at this point, we mean an identification of cell types or cell states or cellular phenotypes um, that we can use as a guide for any sort of downstream analysis that we choose to do. Um, so the data were uh, prepared, compiled uh, within Biohub, sent out to all the collaborating labs who worked on them, annotated them, and then sent us back their cell annotations that along with all the analysis scripts that were used, uh, were collected, curated, and finally released as a, as a GitHub project. Um, all right, so what does this all result to? Um, well, it results to this. Uh, this is kind of the big picture. Here I'm showing you uh, approximately 50,000 cells. Uh, these are all the cells that came from the fact sorting, and there are 20 different tissues represented here. And you can, you know, these graphs look a little bit like the Rorschach type of graphs where you look at them and you say, oh, you know, there is a turtle on the upper right. Uh, but, uh, you know, looking at this, this, this graph contains a lot of information. Most of it is not very useful at this, at this resolution. But what you can start appreciating is that, you know, there are some tissues for which you have the, the basically serve as uh, you know, lone islands uh, where all of the cells of that tissue cluster together with all the other cells of that tissue, as is, for example, this big cluster of uh, orange cells in the middle that are all the microglia from the brain. And then peripheral to that, you can see that and begin to appreciate that there are clusters of cells within defined cells uh, of different organs. And you know, this is the first thing we, we looked at and we're very happy to see that most of the clustering, uh, at least on this level, is not driven by, by tissue, and thus we can start investigating inter the relationship between the same cell type or cell state across different tissues. Um, so I said that uh, you know, to, to, to start interacting with the data and, and uh, formulating some biological hypothesis, the, the graph I showed you, the plot I showed you in the previous slide, it's just you know too abstract, too too zoomed out. So we can actually zoom in and create you know, smaller pictures. So for example, here you see three representative TSNE plots of the cells coming from the mammary gland, the bone marrow, and the pancreas, and they are colored based on cluster and uh, cell type identity. And you can see a cell uh, the counts for each of these identities on the on the on the bottom part of the plot, um, I have to say that uh, in the release data we we included two different annotations of, uh, of 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 cellular phenotypes. The first one is the expert annotation, um, which you know can be non-standard and written in free language. And then we also try to convert these into standard cell ontology annotations, as are the ones that you're actually uh, seeing on this slide. Um, <clears throat> Moving on, we can also go back to the data. As I told you, some of these tissues were actually fact sorted and we can ask uh, uh, what is the agreement between the identified cell types and uh, the, the, the gating that we perform in the facts. Here you see a nice example of the mammary where we identified four different cell types that you can see on the left. This is a TSME projection from the RNA-seq data. Whereas on the right, you see the final gate uh, of CD49, CD24 that was used to sort the cells. And as you can see, each of the three different clusters uh, of cells that were sorted or gated uh, with the facts actually correspond largely to uh, the, the cellular phenotypes identified um, after the RNA sequencing. Um, we can take one step further and ask, so how, how are the relationships uh, between all these different cell types and cell states identified across all these different tissues? And here you see a graph, actually uh, a heat map trying to show exactly these relationships. So here, um, cells or, or clusters of cells that are more similar to each other tend to uh, be close to each other. Um, so for example, you see three highlighted regions uh, of B cells, uh, T cells, and NK cells, as well as endothelial cells going from left to right. And these are cells that have been identified as B, T, or endothelial by 
different people in these different organs, but when we ask how similar are these cells to other cells, then they preferentially tend to cluster uh, together with each other, irrespectively of which tissue um, they came from. Um, we can zoom in on some of those. For example, I mentioned T cells in the previous slide. Here you see a, an analysis of all the T cells that come from uh, six different tissues, uh, like the fat, the lung, which are more peripheral tissues, and then and the muscle, and then more immune type tissues as the marrow, the spleen, and the thymus. Uh, so on the left, you see the annotation of the T cells uh, based on the tissue, and then you see that you know the the bottom half consists of uh, cells coming from the thymus, but in the upper half. Uh, we have T cells that seem to be originating from uh, all the other tissues, including the thymus. And then when we cluster this plot, we, we find five different clusters of T cells. And uh, we can see that uh, cluster zero, the red one down there, is actually undergoing VDG recombination. Uh, uh, it's expressing RAG1 and RAG2. And um, then uh, there is another cluster of T cells on the right, which uh, seems to be expanding. It's also coming from the thymus. Uh, we hypothesize that it's already underwent the combination and it's now proliferating. Uh, you can see expression of top 2A, for example. And then there are three other distinct clusters uh, of um, uh, mature T cells that come uh, from the thymus as well as the other organs uh, with uh, different properties um, <clears throat> amongst them. Uh, we can take this uh, one step uh, further and also ask, are there any transcription factors, for example, that seem to be able to distinguish cell types that were annotated as part of the same category? For example, here you see all the cells annotated as epithelial. So now we can ask, do epithelial cells from different clusters look you know, dissimilar to each other? And if so, can this dissimilarity be explained by the expression of transcription factors? So we do, we perform some sort of transcription factor correlation analysis. So on the left side here, you see a TSNE plot of all the epithelial cells uh, called by tissue. In the middle panel, <clears throat> you see a heat map of such a correlation analysis. And then on the right, you see examples of uh, six different transcription factors that seem to be specifically expressed in epithelial cells uh, that come uh, from a particular tissue and not the others. Um, <clears throat> and I believe with that, uh, I'm done with the presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. I would like to thank uh, all the people at Biohub uh, that were part of this job and are still part of this job. Uh, of this project, uh, Andy May, Norman Neff, uh, Steve Quake, and, and Jim Carcanas in particular. I would like to thank everybody in the Tabula Mirrors Consortium and specifically Tony Viscore and uh, Nick Saum. And I would like to also highlight that the presentations that we have for this project is that the scientific community basically downloads and uh, interacts with this data further and analyzes them and uh, mines them for um, uh, interesting biological hypotheses that, uh, that they can pursue. And the data are available on Fixture and all the, all the code used in this project is also available on GitHub.